Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be diving into the world of ABA therapy, specifically how it can help children with autism develop those all-important social skills. Yeah, and we've gotten a lot of questions from you all about ABA therapy, so we're really excited to break it down for you based on this article from Cheap ABA that a listener sent us. This is going to be interesting, right? Because you might be a parent, a caregiver, an educator, and you really want to know what ABA is all about. Right, like how does it actually work? Yeah, how does it really help improve social skills? Let's find out. And you know one thing that really stood out to me in this article is that ABA isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. Oh, absolutely not. It's very tailored, right? Yeah. It's incredibly tailored to each individual child. It's not like, here's your ABA program, good luck. It's very much, let's figure out what this particular child needs to succeed. You know, some kids learn best visually, others by doing. ABA takes all of that into account. That makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like, you know, with anything else in life, you don't learn the same way as everyone else. Exactly. For one child, social stories might be key, while another might thrive on role-playing real-life scenarios. It's about finding what works for that child. So it's about really understanding the individual. Yes, absolutely. And that actually leads us to one of the core principles of ABA, this idea of positive reinforcement. Okay, can you remind us what that is exactly? Think about it like this. Imagine you're teaching a kid to ride a bike. Oh, I remember that feeling. Right. You don't just put them on and suddenly they know how to balance and pedal. You're uh, holding on. You're encouraging them. Maybe you even let them use training wheels at first, right? <laughs> then you're cheering when they take that first pedal without you. It's all about those little victories. Exactly. That's positive reinforcement in a nutshell. You're breaking down a complex skill in this case, riding a bike into smaller, more manageable steps. And each time the child accomplishes one of those steps, you're there to celebrate that win, whether it's with praise, a high five, a small treat, or even just a big smile. It makes success feel achievable, and it keeps them motivated to keep going. Okay, so I get the breaking it down into smaller steps, but why is the positive part so important? Because it works. Think about it. Would you rather be told you're doing something wrong over and over again, or would you rather be encouraged and supported even when you make mistakes? Okay, that's a no-brainer. Everyone responds better to positivity. Exactly. And this is where the expertise of a board-certified behavior analyst, or a BCBA, is so crucial. Ah, yeah, the article mentioned that, the BCBA. What do they actually do? They're the ones who really understand the ins and outs of ABA. They're like detectives of behavior. They observe the child, figure out what makes them tick, what their strengths are, and what challenges they might be facing. And based on that, they develop a highly personalized treatment plan, almost like a roadmap for developing those social skills. So they're the ones coming up with all these creative strategies we've been talking about, like the bike riding and all that. Exactly. They're the masterminds behind it all. So they're bringing the positive reinforcement, they're understanding the child, and really tailoring that plan for each individual. You got it. They are key to this whole process. It's amazing when you really think about it, right? Like all the things that go into a simple interaction, mm -hmm. we kind of take it for granted. We do. We really do. It's like we forget we had to learn all of this stuff too, you know? But for a child with autism, it's like everyone else got the instruction manual and they're just trying to figure it out as they go. That's such a good way to put it. And that makes me think about those challenges that the article mentioned, you know, when it comes to social skills. It's not that kids with autism can't learn these skills. It's just different for them, right? Exactly. It's about the way they experience the world, the way they process information. Okay, so walk me through some of these challenges. What makes it so tricky for some kids with autism to navigate social situations? Well, one of the things our article highlighted was communication difficulties. Okay, and I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they think, oh, communication, like learning words. But it's so much more than that, right? Way more. Imagine trying to understand sarcasm, for example. I mean, let's be real. Sarcasm can be difficult for anyone to interpret sometimes. But for a child with autism, those subtle social cues, the tone of voice, the facial expressions, it might not click the same way. It's true. You have to think about all the layers of meaning. And it's all happening in real time. So you can imagine how that would be overwhelming. It's not just about knowing the words. It's about understanding the meaning behind the words, which can be a whole other challenge for kids with autism. That makes so much sense. What about social rules? The article mentioned that as another challenge. Oh, yeah. Those unwritten rules that we all just seem to know, but no one ever actually tells you. Exactly. Like how close is too close when you're talking to someone. Right. Or knowing when to take turns in a conversation. 
These are things that typically developing kids often pick up just through observation and practice, but for some children with autism, it can be like trying to decipher a secret code. And if they miss those cues, it can lead to misunderstandings, frustration. It can make it hard to connect with others. And that can be incredibly isolating. Absolutely. And the article also talked about initiating and maintaining interactions as a common challenge, right? Yes, and this is a big one. Imagine that feeling of walking into a party where you don't know anyone. Ooh, yeah, the worst. Now, for some children with autism, that feeling might come up even in everyday situations, like approaching a group of kids who are already playing it can feel totally overwhelming. It's not that they don't want to join in, right? It's just, just all hard. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a lack of desire to interact. It's more about not knowing how to go about it in a way that feels comfortable and natural. Okay, so this is all super insightful. But hearing about all these challenges, it makes me wonder, is the goal of ABA therapy to try to change who these kids are, to make them more like neurotypical kids? That's a really important question. And the short answer is absolutely not. Okay, good. Because yeah. I think a lot of people worry about that. And rightfully so. It's not about erasing those differences or trying to fit anyone into a box. It's about giving them the tools and the understanding they need to navigate the world in a way that works for them. So it's about empowerment, not changing who they are. Exactly. It's about celebrating those differences and saying, hey, let's figure out how to make this work for you. And that's where all those ABA techniques come in. Yeah. And the article went into some of those, right? Those ABA techniques. It did. And they're all about breaking down those complex social skills into smaller, more manageable steps. Kind of like we were talking about with the bike riding example earlier. Right, right. So what are some of the techniques that really stood out to you in the article? Well, one that's really common and really effective is modeling. Modeling, okay. And it's just what it sounds like. It's showing the child, not just huh. telling them. So for example, if you want a child to learn how to join a group of kids who are already playing, the therapist might actually demonstrate that. Like walk up to the group, watch for a bit, listen to what they're saying, and then find a way to join in naturally. That's interesting. So they're not just saying, go make friends. They're actually showing them how it's done. Exactly. And the child can watch and observe and pick up on those subtle social cues that might not be as obvious when you're just telling them what to do. Oh, I see. I see. That makes a lot of sense. What about role playing? Because I remember that from like my drama class back in high school. But how does that work with ABA therapy? So role playing is huge in ABA. Because it's like a dress rehearsal for real life situations, you know? Yeah. Like, let's say a, a child gets really anxious about ordering food at a restaurant. Oh, yeah. Which can be a really common one, right? Yeah. So they might role play that exact scenario with the therapist, like practicing what to say, how to make eye contact with the server, how to handle waiting their turn. So it's like taking away that fear of the unknown. Exactly. Because routines can be really important for a lot of kids with autism. So if they know what to expect, it makes it so much easier. It makes it less scary. Okay, that makes total sense. And what about social stories? Because I've heard that term before, but I'm not quite sure. What are those? Social stories are amazing. They're so helpful. Think of them like um, those picture books that we all loved as kids. Oh, yeah. They're clear. They're engaging. And they break down potentially confusing situations into easier steps. So, you know, they often use simple language and visuals to explain social situations. So, like, if a child was nervous about, I don't know, going to a birthday party, for example, you might. Yes, you could totally have a social story about going to a birthday party. And it might show a child arriving at the party, greeting the birthday person, maybe what to do if they're asked to play a game, opening presents, and then saying goodbye at the end. It just helps them anticipate what to expect, how to behave appropriately in that specific social context. Oh, it's like giving them a little roadmap. Exactly, exactly. And you can even personalize them with like photos of the child, their friends, familiar places, you know, to make it even more relatable. Oh, I love that. That's a really good idea. Okay, so we've got modeling, we've got role playing, we've got social stories. What else? Because I feel like the article mentioned a few more, right? Yeah, so we can't forget about prompting and fading, which basically means that you're providing support when it's needed, and then you gradually reduce that support as the child's skills develop. Okay, and prompting and fading, I have to admit, that's one where like my brain goes a little fuzzy. Yeah. So can you give me like a real-life example of how that works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's imagine you're teaching a child to, I don't know, 
tie their shoes. At first, you might use a hand over hand approach, you know, where you're physically guiding their movements. Okay, yeah. And that's the prompting phase. But as they start to get the hang of it, you might just start giving them verbal cues like, okay, now make the loop and then tuck it through. Right. right. And that's fading. And then eventually, the goal is that they're tying their shoes all by themselves. It's like taking the training wheels off. Exactly. Wow. And it's the same principle with social skills. You start with whatever level of support the child needs and then gradually fade it out as they gain confidence and independence. I like that a lot. And we were just talking about, you know, practicing those skills. And I mean, when we think about social skills, interacting with peers, that's like, that's huge. Huge. You know? And that's where peer mediated interactions come in. OK, so what does that look like? What are peer mediated interactions? So this might involve setting up like carefully structured play dates or group activities where typically developing peers can model those positive social behaviors. Oh, so they're actually getting that real world experience in a, in a safe and controlled way. Exactly. It's one thing to learn a skill in isolation, but to really master it, you need to be able to generalize it to different settings, different people. Right. And peer mediated interactions, they give children with autism the opportunity to learn from their peers who often speak the same language, so mm -hmm. to speak. They can just be themselves. Exactly. Exactly. This has been so eye opening. I feel like we've really gotten a good overview of, of how ABA works, all these different techniques. But I do have one more question for you. How do you measure progress? Because we're talking about something as nuanced as social skills. Mm -hmm. How do you know if it's working? That's such a good question. And that's where the science of ABA really comes in, because it's not just about, you know, warm fuzzies and hoping for the best. It's about setting measurable goals and tracking progress. OK, so what does that look like? What kinds of things might you track? Well, it really depends on the child's individual goals, right? But you might look at things like, you know, how often does a child initiate a conversation? How do they respond when a peer invites them to play? How long can they engage in an interaction before getting overwhelmed? So you're really looking at those specific behaviors and seeing how they change over time. Exactly. It's all about being data driven, making sure that what you're doing is actually working. And also it lets you celebrate those victories along the way. Because even small changes can make a huge difference. I love that. Celebrating those small victories. Mm -hmm. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. I feel like I've learned so much about ABA therapy. Of course. Happy to chat about it anytime. It's a real passion of mine. And I think we've all learned a lot today. So thank you to everyone out there for joining us for another deep dive. And until next time, keep those questions coming.